Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Lean Toss-Up Call of Duty League podcast. This is it, guys. This is Major 4, the official end of the Call of Duty League regular season. I guess this is technically regular season, asterisk, but yeah, whatever. It's the end of the official season. All that's left is champs, and then there will be the Esports World Cup at the end. So we are down to three more Call of Duty League podcasts for this year. Don't worry. I'm sure we'll be back next year. We invested all this in the video. No, I'm just kidding. We're, we'll be back next year. But again, for this year, there's only this, including this one, three more. I am joined, as always, by my co-host, CDL Metrics. You ready for Major 4? I am. Yeah, this shapes up to be a very interesting Major. I think Nameless said it best at the end of the matches on Sunday. He said, just looking at this bracket, this is by far the most interesting bracket we've had so far this year. And I tend to agree with him on that. We'll go into the, the details of that later, but uh, yeah, a lot of, we knew a lot of matches last weekend were gonna be very consequential, but I would even argue that there were matches that we were somewhat overlooking that ended up being very important for seeding, for the CDL point standings, all of that. So uh, yeah, very interesting last weekend and hopefully we'll get uh, a good major uh, this weekend, even though it's not technically hosted by any team, it's just, in Burbank, California, so the LA teams, I guess, are the hosts, but um, yeah, I think the CDL is technically hosting uh, this one. So a little bit of a different vibe, maybe, but still looking forward to it nonetheless. Yeah, I, I, I can I can agree with that. It is just major for Burbank, not even named after a team or just a city, Burbank, not even a particularly notable city, just a city of Burbank, California. Not like LA. No, they're just like, it's Burbank. I guess we can't, we, LA would be two teams. We can't be with, it's not theirs. It's a, it's a different city. It's beside the city. So it's like when, remember when Optic was like, oh, we want to be, we want to be like, they're like, oh, we want to be Dallas. And they're like, oh, you can't be Dallas because Hex was like, oh, we want to be Optic Dallas. And they're like, okay, well, you can't be Dallas because they, I think they wanted Jerry Jones to probably buy a Call of Duty League team so they have to hold that slot open. It's so, okay, can we be Fort, Optic Fort Worth? They're like, no, you can't do that. It's the same thing. But anyways, moving on, we have some news this week already. We have news of the week. We had talked a little bit about this before, not like specifically this, but we said, hey, guess what? There could be some change, some really big changes going on. And we said, now I had penciled those in for about three weeks from now after Champs. But it turns out that apparently we're getting a head start on some of those changes already. So Cloud9 planned to acquire the New York Subliners ahead of the EWC, which is the Esports World Cup there in Riyadh. That's in August. This is interesting. So there are a lot of questions here about what this is. So... Obviously, I have some huge questions about this. None of them have been answered yet. Question one, why are you acquiring a CDL team? If you're Cloud9, just get into the CDL. You're Cloud9. You can eat. If the CDL wanted to expand, there you go. Do the subliners want to get out of the CDL? This is the fact that a bunch of owners of these teams b basically bought the, these league slots, and now they want out as well. What's going to happen to the Subliners branding? Subliners are actually among one of the better brands in the CDL itself. So this is far from like the LAG of the CDL. This is a team that has one chance, right? They are among one of the better teams in the, among one of the better market teams in the CDL. They're now being bought by Cloud9. Is it going to be, are they still going to be the New York Subliners? Are they going to be just the Cloud9 Subliners? Are they just Cloud9? Are they just going to be the Subliners? There's a lot more questions here. This is a good sign, though. I will say it's a good sign that new money is going to come into the league. But this opens up a lot of questions that we do not have answers yet to. What are what were your thoughts when you first heard about this? Yeah, I thought it was interesting for a couple reasons. One, primarily just because it's a major player that hasn't been in the COD League so far since its creation back in 2019, 2020. We had heard rumors about if the COD League does expand, Cloud9 seems like an organization that would want in. their major players in other esports. They have a big following, a big fan base. So why not join in on the CDL? So that, that's just interesting, just anytime you get a new player involved. What I think is very interesting is that they're acquiring, you're right, a, like a big name brand for the CDL. New York Subliners have existed with this branding since the inception of the CDL. 
They have been a relatively successful organization. Their first year in the league was a little shaky, but they've gotten, I would say, progressively better through the years. Their teams have changed a lot. They haven't had a core two or three players on their team. Over the last few years, they have, right, with Hydra and now Kismet. That's a duo. They brought back Skies from last year. But, like, they've had a ton of turnover when you think about what this team looked like three years ago, four years ago, and what it looks like now. And even the coaching staff, that sort of thing. There's been a lot of turnover there. But they've been a steady org. They've been a relatively successful org, one that has a good following as well. It's a surprise to me that Cloud9 is acquiring such a big-name brand. But it takes two to tango, right? New York Subliners must have wanted this as well. But in theory, it makes more sense for Cloud9 to buy out an LA Gorillas or a Vegas Legion. This organization that hasn't been as successful and maybe needs extra cash or just wants to get out because they just haven't had that much success. That's a bit of a surprise. Yeah, we'll see how it shakes out ahead of the Esports World Cup. Is there going to be any rebranding involving Cloud9? Maybe not. Maybe more of that will come later this fall when the next season of the CDL kicks off. But, But yeah, still very noteworthy. We'll see if any other similar news comes up involving teams getting acquired. We had that Minnesota Rocker acquisition earlier in the year. We obviously had Miami Heretics come in this year and buy out that Florida Mutineers spot or however that shook out. So it's not something that's new, right? Like teams have been bought out and whatnot over the last couple of years somewhat regularly. But yeah, just to see a a big name team like New York Subliners go through with this is just a bit of a surprise. Yeah, we'll see how it all shakes out, and we'll see if we have any other similar players moving forward. Yeah, I agree. I think it's very, it's going to be very interesting. I think let's see what, let's see what subline, let's, I, the thing is, and you mentioned it too, they're acquiring one of the most successful brands. Now, to be fair, they are, they arguably are acquiring one of, a top five player in the league in Hydra. So they are acquiring a, a really strong already existing roster versus with LAG, it's just a complete rebuild, right? So that being said though, I am a little concerned that you're starting to now like, <laughs> this is now locking in generational inequality here where it's okay, the top four teams, the top four teams now and everybody else is fighting for scraps. Eventually through new talent in, being infused into the league, You'll start those talented players that they come in. Maybe you'll get to a top five, top six teams. But if you're locking in those top four teams, basically, and it's okay, they're not, those players are locked in now. You're not getting those players in the free market anymore. That's a little concerning as well. I do want to say, though, that, and you mentioned the point, it's clear subliners wanted this. It's clear, I think they want it out. Now, I do wonder about some of these teams. You have to wonder is, and again, now to be fair, if you had said, oh, which teams do you think this is? I would not have said subliners first, but it's possible a lot of people bought this thing, bought this the league slot for $25 million, thought it was going to appreciate, which could flip this in 10 years, 20 years for $100 million, maybe even a billion, theoretically, if you compound it enough, right? And, and a billion is in terms of an, an international a, a franchise league is actually not much, right? Some of these hockey teams are, are like, if you go 20 years in the future, yeah, some an entry-level NHL team could be a billion or two, right? Theoretically, if esports continue to expand, that could be what you're looking at, a couple hundred million to a billion dollars in, in some of these cases. I, uh, you wonder if a lot of these guys got in here, said, okay, I'll buy this league slot, and now all of a sudden you're sitting here and you're like, oh, now we, now this league slot is free. We, we got this league slot for the low price of free. And any chance we have of flipping this in 20 years for a massive gain is dead now. So you're, we have nothing, we don't want to do esports. We just wanted to buy this thing and then flip it in 20 years. So we're done now, right? And that would be subliners. And this is where some of your more traditional, cause like again, Toronto Ultra, Mad Lions, right? Atlanta Phase, obviously Phase Clan, Optic Gaming, uh, 100 Thieves, 80 Thieves, 100 Thieves. Some of those existing brands already exist. And hilariously enough, it's I just mentioned the top three of the top four teams in the league, obviously subliners being the fourth top team. But the other ones below, 
Heretics actually are a team. Again, these are a lot of teams that share. These are a lot of, of basically companies that share teams in League of Legends as well as in the Call of Duty League team and League of Legends team, CSGO teams. There's a lot of commonalities between a lot of these esports clubs. And that's if you when you go back to the pre CDL era, you saw a lot of them. You saw Envy, you saw Gen G, you saw all these teams that are now in other esports they were in the call of duty league we might be at the beginning now where a lot of them are coming back in now this is interesting it's curious if this is the only one i i very much doubt this would be the only one i think if cloud nine is coming in i think you're going to see a lot more i think you're going to see a lot more other esports another a lot more leagues coming into to this as well it's very fascinating I, i'm intrigued to see what's going to happen we don't know what's going to happen yet but this is setting the stage for a very long podcast before the esports world cup that's that's my take on it at least but we'll have to see we'll see anyways moving on 12 seed boston breach technically not dead yet we have and we have been careful with saying this because we've always been like boston is done asterisk there's no way asterisk because we've been saying this we're like okay it's probably but theoretically if Boston were to beat Legion in losers round one, and then the Gorillas lose to Ultra, which is likely, and then the Gorillas were to beat Ravens, which is p- definitely possible, then Gorillas lose to Optic Thieves slash Heretics, Rocker lose to Phase Subliners, and then if the Breach were to win Major Four, they would make it to champs. Now, is this likely? Not at all, no. Could this end instantaneously against the Las Vegas Legion round one? Yeah. Is it likely to end round one against the Las Vegas Legion? Yeah. But it could happen, which is yeah. untrue it's, of the NFL. But <laughs> It's insane, but I just wanted to bring this up because this is my bad. I did say last week that I was almost certain. I didn't say I was certain, but I was almost certain that Boston Breach are, even if they win the major and won last week versus Optic or in one their other match. Technically, they could get enough points to be above that cutoff line, but they would get boxed out by other teams that are guaranteed to pick up points. But my thinking was flawed. There were there is enough wiggle room for Boston to pass to outright pass some of these teams that are on the 8 seed line, 9 seed line, that sort of thing. My bad on that. Still functionally, they won't make champs. I'll say that right now. Bold statement. Boston Breach won't make champs. But I just like what Jake Hale tweeted out here because as soon as they beat Optic last weekend, I was like looking at the standings and I was like, I actually think they could wiggle out somehow and make the major if they win and all these teams on the cut line lose right away. And sure enough, Jake Hale put it in a tweet. Now it does, it looks a little simpler than it actually is. He's put it into six bullet points, but if you really think about it, it's 10 or 11 or 12 things that have to go right because that last one he lists, right? Breach have to win major four. That's six games, <laughs> right? That They need to win six straight. And I don't know if you know this, Robert, they have six wins on the year. So that's going to be tough. They're going to have to double their win total in the matter of four days. Uh, And then even that first bullet point, beat Legion, losers round one. That implies that Legion lose to Surge in winners round one. So even if that happens, if the opposite happens and Surge lose, then I think they're cooked anyway. So yeah, it's a 0.00001% chance that all of this happens. And even that might be a little too high. But I did just want to put a correction out there that I did say that Boston Breach was dead last week. They're technically not, but they functionally are. Good luck to Breach. Yeah, that's all I'll say. (laughs) Good luck. So you're saying there's a chance. (laughs) I am saying there's a chance, but you're not going to like the odds. No, obviously. It is far from likely, far from probable. It's not even... Hail Marys in the NFL have better chances than this. Far better chances than this. But yeah, it's... We'll see. It, it, they are not dead, but that's just because of weird math flukes and because the league is terrible this year. Not specifically, the teams that are not 1 through 4 are terrible this year. That's the only reason this is even a possibility. Because if you even remotely distribute the points from the top 4 down, Breach would have been eliminated before Major 4 qualifiers you begin. But because there is still such a gap between the top 4 and the bottom 8, because of that, this even makes this mathematically possible. Anyways... 
CDL standings, speaking of them, yeah, so basically, yeah, Boston is only 90 points out of eighth. Easy. Just win the major and have a bunch of weird stuff happen, and you're good. But again, and as we've been saying all year long, actually, it's, it's funny. I, w I care a little bit, but not enough to actually do this. I'd love to actually chart through the season the percentage of points that are earned by the top four and then the percentage of points that are owned by the bottom eight. And I feel like it's what's going to happen is after every major, it spikes up. And then during the qualifiers, it slowly trickles down and it spikes back up again. Um, but I, to be fair, I, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care enough to do it. But it'd be fun to do that as a graph. But no, I'm, I'm good. But anyways, again, this is we're right around that point. Heretics have actually had a pretty good major, so that's why they are a slightly good qualifier. That's why they are just slightly over half of the fourth team. And again, this is a key number we've been looking at all year long, right? Uh, basically, the gap between fourth and five, and it's basically been double. And I think once subliners go through the major, I think that they'll probably come back to, to your double again. But then again, basically 170 through to 140. So there's a 30-point gap, so it was closer than it was a couple weeks ago. But still, though not particularly not particularly great again the other cool thing when you look at these standings is you look at some of these phase have lost more maps than than most of these have, have lost less maps than, than these teams have wins it's like it when you look at some of this stuff it's it, the, the numbers are just insane in terms of like how many more games these teams have played than these teams it's actually nuts like it's they, the top four have played so many more games than the bottom eight. It's just, it's absolutely crazy. It, the, the differential is nuts. Look at it, map count, right? Boston has played about 120 maps. FaZe has won almost 120 maps. That alone is nuts. That stat is nuts. It's They've won more maps than they've played. It's crazy, but that's the power of staying in tournaments, right? And, and Breach has definitely not done that. Any Anyone to add to this slide? Yeah, the real interesting thing for me, at least, is that champs cutoff line. Right now we see Legion are the 8th seed, but they are tied with Ravens at 150 points. LAG right behind them, 140, and Rocker right behind them with 140. We already talked about Breach. They really don't have much of a shot at all to make the champs. So we're looking at, if we say Miami and Seattle are safe, which... I don't want to say they're totally safe yet, but they are really looking good. Both of those teams starting in the winner's bracket, both have very winnable games in round one. And if you get that round one win, that is 30 points in the bank. So you get that done, you're at 200 now, you are looking good. L LA Thieves are in an interesting spot as well because it's not a 10-point cushion that they have, it's a 15-point cushion, which is a big deal with how points are distributed at majors, there typically is a 15-point gap between placements. So even if they have a bad major and someone at 150 or 140 plays really well, I still think they'll at least be tied with a team, and then we'll get into tiebreakers and stuff. So I think LA Thieves are in a relatively good spot as well. Another very winnable winner's round one match for them as well. So you just get that done. You're looking really safe. One thing that I want to talk about with the bracket specifically is that potential losers bracket round one match between uh, LA Gorillas and Carolina Royal Ravens because that will be an elimination game functionally. And that would need to be Toronto beat LAG, which is very likely to happen. And if that does happen, Carolina and LAG will face off in basically a playoff match, you know, on the second day of major four. So that could be a lot of fun. And then, yeah, lastly, I'll just mention Minnesota Rocker. I'm wearing my Minnesota Rocker shirt today because I feel like it'll be the last time that I can until October, November, December, whenever, or I suppose August if they show up at the World Cup or something. But yeah, Rocker, really bad end of the qualifier stage. They are in lower bracket. And not only are they in lower bracket, but they play the loser of phase versus subliners, which is by far the worst draw you could get. So if I had to guess today, I would say LAG, Minnesota, and Boston, that 10, 11, 12, they will stay out of champs. And it really just comes down to Carolina versus Legion. And we'll see if they match up at all during this tournament. It could happen. 
It won't happen for a little while, though, because I think they are on opposite sides of the winner's round one. Or Carolina's actually in low, uh, loser's round one. But still, that that is going to be the dynamic. Can Ravens jump Legion? I think that'll be the big talking point. But, but yeah, a lot to talk about. If you want to jump to the bracket on the next slide, I yeah. don't know if you have any other thoughts between those winner's bracket starts or the lower bracket teams, anything there? Yeah, no, it's... It, it, it does set up very interesting matchups. You have Surge, Legion, round one. I think the winner of that probably makes champs just from math. Thieves, Heretics, again, almost the same thing. That's two of those. Phase Subliners, a great match. Not particularly relevant, relevant for champs, but interesting in, in longevity for the tournament as well. Subliners did take Phase to a map five just a couple weeks ago. And not, don't count Subliners out completely, despite what my model might say. Spoiler alert. Toronto LAG, again, same thing. Toronto's been looking a lot better the last couple of weeks. Optic in the lower bracket, that is a shocker. Yeah, I don't know, but the problem is, the thing is, to be fair, Optic's going, Optic is going to champs, they're going to be fine. The thing is, though, how far do they get into this tournament, how, and how does that affect their point standings for going into champs, and how does it affect their seeding for champs, right? But yeah, I think, fundamentally, that the top eight, with the exception of Optic being in there, I think those are the top eight teams all year long. They feel like they are the top eight teams, and I think Optic, obviously, should pr probably be in place there instead of LAG, but that's roughly what I would put the top eight teams. That's my take on the, on the bracket. Moving on, major qualifiers wins over expectations. Ultra overperformed. Ultra is actually the number one seed. That's why they got to play LAG. FaZe actually the number two seed there. They both had six wins, but Ultra had the tiebreaker, obviously. So FaZe slightly underperforming it, but again, that's a good call there on the six wins exactly on the dot, and then they had that one. So basically, the prob probabilistically, they were going to lose one of the games between Toronto and Subliners. They won one, lost the other one, etc. Everybody else fundamentally underperforming. You've got Seattle, Thieves, Seattle, Thieves, Miami, LAG. They're all lower. Or no, actually, they're all higher. Sorry, they're all oh. higher. <laughs> they're all above, and that's taken from the bottom teams here, and specifically Optic. But that's basically how that math works, right? It's the... The numbers all have to add up, right? All these numbers add up to the same number, basically. Except the fact that they have to come from somewhere. Obviously, Optic is shoveled off. And I'm not sure. Optic, I know, played Legion. Did they play Miami? I think they did play Miami, didn't they? They did. They actually, uh, that was their one win all qualifier oh. stage. But yeah, you, you mentioned it. There's that three, four, five, six seed all in the middle. They all overperformed. And a lot of those teams played Optic. So that's not much of a surprise considering Optic underperformed greatly. I don't know if there's ever been a team that I've missed so much on with Op Optic I thought are getting probably 6 wins. 5 would be a little bit of a disappointment and they ended up with 1. So yeah, huge shift there. I'd say and the other top mm -hmm. teams were functionally in the spot they needed to be. Toronto slight overperformer, Phase in New York kind of did what was expected. Carolina was sitting right on their number. Minnesota, I hit pretty well. Boston, with a little bit of good luck, maybe gets to two wins instead of just one. But but yeah, it's all those teams in the middle that just picked off Optic. That's where we shook out. Unfortunately for us as well, uh, I had mentioned all those crazy tiebreaker scenarios that could have happened last weekend. We did get a five-way tie. Unfortunately, it was the three through seven seed, which functionally doesn't matter a whole lot. I guess the seven seed, you don't want to be that last team because then you're playing Toronto or Atlanta, and that's where New York find themselves. But that little wrinkle actually creates a really interesting bracket, in my opinion. We did get a crazy five-way tiebreaker. Um, unfortunately, it didn't hover around the cut line, but we did also get a tiebreaker on the cut line between LAG and Carolina. That really went down to the last match of last weekend. Carolina was rooting for New York to win, but LA Thieves pulled out the reverse sweep. That got LA Thieves the four seed, which is much preferred over the seven seed, which New York ended up with, and shut out Carolina from upper brackets. Yeah, a huge swing just in that last game, but we mentioned it earlier, that Toronto-Atlanta series turned out to be a big deal. We knew it, it mattered in terms of one seed versus two seed. Little did we know, New York would end up as the seven seed, and... Yeah, so Atlanta losing that to Toronto gives them a much more difficult winner's round one match because we were expecting, okay, the loser will get the two seed and then you're playing 
Vegas or you're playing Miami or Thebes or something like that. It's, no, you're playing subliners. So uh, a lot of interesting dynamics with how last weekend played out. But yeah, enough talk about this. Let's jump into these games. Yeah. So quick update, beating the market and combined mall results. I went two and one on the week. You went one and two on the week. I had, I did tell, I did have Boston to cover the plus two and a half versus Texas. Not going to lie. It was not easy to do that. Uh, they did pull it off in the search. And, no, no, it was in the control, right? Uh, or no, it was, was the search. game two. No, it was just, they got six, the search, four. Yeah. And then game four. And they lost game three. Then they won game four. Massive comeback to come. It was a huge comeback for Boston to win. They probabilistically were not winning the game, but definitely covering the two and a half wasn't a bad bet there either. Heretics versus Seattle. Yep, that was a nice win there. I think that should have been a 3-1, but it unfortunately was not. They did have to take it to a game five to win that. And then I had Legion versus Thieves. That did not cash, unfortunately. So I did go two and one. You you also doubled down on Heretics versus Seattle. We both cashed that one. That was nice. You had Optic versus Toronto. I actually thought Optic would have a, would have put up a good fight against Toronto. So that was I agree with that one too. But unfortunately, that one did not cash. And then LEG versus Seattle. I was on that one as well. That one did not cash. But that was one and one and two for you on the week. Combined auto plays actually went pretty well. Miami money line plus one and a half did not win map two. Did not win the search, but that's fine. Legion did win map one against Thieves. Absolutely destroyed them map one. LAG did not win the game, the series, but they did win the control. And then Optic just, well, not bad, but the, op, the Optic line there just crushing us there on that one. Race to 1580. So we, when we last talked about this, the gap, we last had this graph, the gap was 90, was 90 points. And that is now down to 10 points. That is down to a 10 point gap. And again, this is all from the bottom teams. Uh, like uh, optic and phase have more points than my top two ticks which is funny again we basically both picked two of the top four teams your two were better than my two but my bottom four picks are just over like largely overperforming your bottom four picks and that's the thing now again that's the trade-off right because i got to pick the next two i picked i basically i picked i think you picked phase then i picked Mm -hmm. toronto subliners then you went optic and i think you were the next pick too but then that but then basically the other picks that did balance out in that way no it's gonna be very close at this point a 10 point gap is literally nothing it's just whoever's team wins the major if it's phase or optic you win if it's ultra or subliners i win that's basically what we're down to now at this point that's yeah it. one thing i do want to mention with this so yeah optics performance during these qualifier stage it, it like totally just put me down the drain. If it wasn't for mm-hmm. optics, just downfall, I think I'd still have a bit of a cushion, but because of that, yeah, we're basically going in tied. I do think there's a scenario where we could end in a tie just because mm. it's a race to 1580, which is an even number, which means the total amount of CDL points given out throughout the year is an even number. It's whatever 1580 doubled would be. 3160, I think, if I'm doing my math correctly. So we might tie. That definitely could happen. The worry I have, it's very interesting what we have going into this because I have the favorite to win, which is Atlanta Phase, but you have the next two teams, Toronto and New York. So you have more outs, I would say, and every team that's in the lower bracket is one of my teams. So that is bad. Do you have teams guaranteed going to winner's round two? At least banking 30 points for each of those teams that wins those. And I have four teams that I think I have guaranteed zero pointers if, I, if those upper bracket teams fall down to my lower bracket teams and they're the same. Those are guaranteed zero. So I'm really relying on FaZe to just win which I think is very possible, but it does create this interesting dynamic of I maybe have the best team, but you got a lot of other teams that could make nice runs in the tournament. Yeah, we'll see how it all shakes out, but it is interesting. If I, last thing, I'll touch on this, and then we'll just, we'll see what happens. I was good with my first two picks. I picked optimally, right? Phase so far, still the top Mm -hmm. team in CDL points. Optic was the top four team that was left, so I scooped them up. If I pick any other team but Boston Breach with pick five, I'm looking really good because not only do I not have Breach, right? You are more likely to take Breach at that point. Uh, I maybe still get them later in the draft, but still, if I pick any other team at pick five, I'm looking much better. And on the flip side, your second pick, if it's Optic instead of New York, 
Now you're looking really good. So a couple of hiccups there, but I'd say functionally we did a pretty good job picking the teams in the order that we did. Yeah, it just it creates this really interesting dynamic where we are as close as you can be heading into the last event of the season. So it should be fun. Yeah, it is. And it's really cool because it's actually been really fun tra- uh, tracking, tracking, tracking this through the entire thing. And it's, yeah, it's a blast because it shows you that we, I, with the exception of Boston, and to be fair, Boston did underperform a lot this year. But with the exception of Boston, we were really good at picking. We were like, okay, these are the top four teams. These are the next four teams. And I think we literally have them almost exactly nailed, with the exception of, I think, Seattle slightly being higher but like thieves, heretics, like we we knew which the top teams were going to be, and we called them almost perfectly, right? So it, it's really cool to see that in, in that point. And this is a fun game within the game because like through, throughout the last qualifiers, you, two of your teams would play against each other, and I'm like, oh, I don't have anybody to root for here. But I'm realized like, oh no, I want this team to win because then it forces this other team to have a higher odds of being in the losers bracket. So. It's this fun game within the game, and it's, it's been fun to do this all year. So hopefully there will be some sort of confi- structure like this next year. Maybe we'll see. But I'd love to do something like this next year if we can. So let, let's see. Maybe we'll have a race to 1580 part two, which, again, there is like a 0% chance it will be this number. There's like a – it will not be – there will be – we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out as we go. But anyways, match previews, odds via Bet365 and our friends at Bovada. Match one, again, we only have four matches to talk about today. Surge versus Legion. Surge minus 175 on the money line, minus one and a half plus 125. 14 and a half point favorites in the hard point, one and a half round favorites in the search, and then one and a half round favorites in the control, but it is shaded to plus 150 there. I, uh, my model likes v- Legion as it has all year, uh, which is initially bad for my race to 1580, because Legion is actually your team. But I really do the plus one and a half. Uh, I like the money line, I like the map one. You are a tad lower on Seattle than the market, but similar to market on Legion. I really do like Legion here. I think Legion has a half-decent shot at this. I think they're among the better teams, but they will randomly do things and look horrible, and I don't like that. But I'm not the biggest fan of the way Seattle is at least currently constructed. What are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, totally agree with you. I do prefer Legion in this spot. Uh, I'll be rooting for them for my race to 1580 teams because this is a head-to-head between two of our teams. So yeah, this one is priced incorrectly, I think, ever so slightly. These teams matched up just a couple weeks ago. It did go to a game five, but Legion actually won that. If you look map by map, it was it, it really could have gone either way. Legion sneak out a game one win. That was really the difference in this one because game two and game five, very comfortable search wins for Legion. But I do want to point that out, right? Going into that match, for sure, we were talking like Seattle are the better search team. We expect them to beat Legion, but Legion have found this new... I don't know what to call it. New energy in Search and Destroy. Not that they're a good search team, but they're at least better than what they were early in the season. But you look at the two maps Seattle won, they won 3-0 Karachi Control, and then they won 250 to 84 Karachi Hardpoint. If you're Vegas, maybe you should veto those maps this time around because they weren't even close. I don't really know what your other, if your alternative maps are any better, but just based on what you saw a couple weeks ago, I think vetoing those is the way to go. But yeah, I'm just surprised that result didn't shift the odds on this match more. So to me, I like Vegas. I think they can cover that one and a half a lot of the time, more than market seems to indicate. I get that it's minus 175, but like Legion are solid hard point team, solid control team. I think they can get a search in there somewhere. I just think there's enough outs for them to force that game five. To me, I'd rather play the plus one and a half than the money line just because of that reliance on hardpoint. Their hardpoint has been better over the last few weeks as well. Seattle's has been a little up and down, but that's the tale with both of these teams, both somewhat hot and cold, but I'd say Legion trending up more than Seattle at this point. And both of these teams were four and three in the qualifier stage. So both showed some good, both showed some bad. Legion had the head to head. So all of that leads me to point to Vegas Legion in this spot, but all that to say, I do have Seattle Surge as slight favorites. So to me, a fair price on this would probably be 
plus 110, minus 150, something like that. But the fact that you're getting plus 125 on Legion is somewhat valuable Tempting. to me. So I'm mm-hmm. with you on Legion. Yeah, it's... There have been times when I've seen Legion and I'm like, oh, this team is really good. And then there's the times I've seen Legion and I'm like, this team is horrible. Why is this team so horrible? And I think that's fundamentally the issue there on that one. Moving on, second match of the day. This is a match between my t- uh, two of my teams, Toronto versus LAG. Toronto minus 1,200 on the money line, minus 2.5, plus 120. So not a full, not favored to, to sweep, just a slight underdog to sweep. 55.5 point favorites in the hard point, 1.5 round favorites in the search, and then 1.5 round favorites in the control. I, I, like, my model doesn't like Legion to gorillas doesn't like them to win per se but it does like them to cover the two and a half and that's fundamentally a hard point problem and to a lesser extent a control problem my model really doesn't like toronto's search and control at least against legions i think legions actually pretty half decent in some of those modes i do like them in hard point not not you actually like them in hard point more but i think the spread is a bit wrong for the hard point i think toronto should win by more than the spread in hard point but other than that, though, I, I can't endorse the minus two and a half, and, and I don't think you could endorse it either. But that being said, though, I don't love a plus two and a half at minus 163. What are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, this one is about right, I would say, price-wise. Um, so as it stands now, I don't really see value in anything. I'm looking at your model and what it likes, and it does make sense. Like, you are high on LAG Search and Destroy. Uh, you have them as slight favorites, actually, in that mode. And I don't know if I'd go that far, but their search has been solid lately. They have a couple round 11 losses mixed into this qualifier stage. But outside of that, they've been pretty solid, especially against some decent search teams. Whereas Toronto's search and destroy has kind of gone back to that inconsistent. They win about half of them thing. So I could totally see LAG catching Toronto on map two, especially if map two is LAG's pick, map pick, I think then for sure they are live to win it uh, and force at least that game four. Yeah, hard point and control is another story, right? Toronto's hard point, still very good. I grade them out as the best hard point team in the game. LAG, very close to the bottom. And yeah, unless the control vetoes get a little weird, I really think LAG's only path is through search and destroy. It's tough for me to see them win the series, but they could extend it if they get that map two win. But crazy things happen. Maybe they play like high-rise control and a propane tank blows up the entire Toronto Ultra team. Like random stuff like that can happen any day, it seems. So I don't want to count out LAG entirely, but it feels like they're going to need a little bit of luck to get the W in this one. Yeah, I think Toronto win this pretty comfortably, but yeah, I wouldn't be shocked at all if LAG at least, you know, don't get swept. We'll see. But uh, yeah, for this one, it's not a huge deal for LAG. It would be a heck of a pickup if you can get the win. But really, their tournament will probably start when they play Carolina Royal Ravens the next day and try to keep their champs' hopes alive. That would be an interesting game to talk about if it were to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where I'm at on this one. Yeah, agreed with that. All right, match three, Subliner versus Phase. This is a match between two of our teams. Phase minus 400 in the money line, minus 1.5, minus 163. 36.5 point favorite in the hard point, 1.5 point one and a half round favorites in the search, and then 1.5 round favorites in the control. My model just loves Phase pretty much across the board, except so much in the hard point. Not as much in the hard point, but it loves them in search and loves them in control. I agree. I don't know if I love the minus 1.5 that much. It is still a bit too high on that. My model just really loves phase, and I'm not completely sure why it loves phase that much, but it just does. To be fair, phase is phase, right? It's not really its fault. It is, they are one of the best teams in the league, but it just really seems to really like them. Maybe just a little bit too much, I'd say, but it does seem to really like them. So I don't know. And, but they've lost, they lost to ultra at this stage and they were close to subliners last time. But I, at this point, I can't endorse the subliners plus one and a half. The model does seem to really face here. Do you see any value in subliners? Or are you just gonna, you might just look, I think this is letting this one ride is probably the best option, except maybe picking on a search spread or something. 
Yeah, this one is a stay away for me, just because if you like phase, which it seems like your model does, and I do, right, functionally, like I, I still think phase are a cut above any other team, including Toronto Ultra, including New York, even though Toronto did just beat phase, I still think there is a tier break between phase and team two, whoever that is. I'd rather play phase through a futures market than in this game specifically, because if they were to win major four, they got to get through New York in round one, probably anyway. That's the path. Obviously, they could win Major 4, losing this game and then going on a six-game winning streak. But the path is way, way easier, assuming they get through New York, which isn't a fair assumption to make, but it is still a likely outcome. So that's how I would play this. If you like Atlanta, just take them to win the whole thing or take them to get to Sunday or whatever. But, but yeah, the thing that spooks me too with this match specifically is their head-to-head -head that happened a few weeks ago. Phase won, but my goodness, it was very close. Phase got a round 11 win in game two, an eight-point win in game four, and then a round 10 win in game five. So a couple searches that were pretty darn close, both went Phase's way. An eight-point hard point game that went Phase's way. The other two maps, like New York's maps that they won, were also very close. A round, a round five control and a 42-point win on hard point, which is comfortable, but it's still a little tight. So yeah, just very close maps. Sub-base was not played in that series, which I think is noteworthy because we knew FaZe had been testing that against some teams, but for whatever reason, it didn't show up in this series. Yeah, New York gives me enough pause where I'm like, I don't really want to have a say in this specific match, but I think it's totally viable to take phase in the futures market because in order for that to happen, right, like they have to get through this match to begin with, if that makes sense. So that's where I sit with this one, a very interesting uh, winner's round one match um, in the grand scheme of, right, like are these teams making <laughs> champs? Yes, it doesn't really matter for that sort of thing. Uh, and even if you lose this match, you get Minnesota Rocker in losers round one. So that's not a huge deal either. Both of these teams will be massive favorites over Rocker. So yeah, still an interesting match though, because it is two top teams. But I, I would lean phase if you were to make me pick on one side or the other. Yeah, I, I agree with that assessment. Moving on, last match of Thursday. Heretics versus Thieves. Thieves, mi Thieves minus 125 on the money line. Minus one and a half, plus 175. They are actually 20 point underdogs in the hard point. Yeah, I think they are. Yeah, they are they're underdogs in the hard point. Heretics hard point is that good. It is that good, guys. Minus 138 in the search, though, which is, I guess, favorites. But it is a bit of a mixed bag there in the favorites. And then they're one and a half round favorites in the, in the control. But that's shaded to plus 160. Yeah, I am pretty much on market for most of this. I do Miami just a tad, though. I do see some value in the Miami money line. I don't hate playing that. This is a bit hard to find value in just a one-day slate, but I don't hate some of the value on Miami there as well. I wouldn't necessarily hate a Miami minus one and a half either, because if you think they're good in, as my model does, if you think they're good in hard point, if you think they're good in search, then something like a one two four or one two three one two three one two four comes up, and then you're like, okay, there's a very clear path to getting a three one here, and it's not that bad. But they need to win the hard point and the search. Having a little bit on the minus one and a half, which is probably two something, is not bad at all. Do you like anything in this match, or are you just gonna stay away from this one? Yeah, I do lean Miami, and I've been saying that for weeks now, but I still lean Miami. They've been good to me over the last few weeks, covering map spreads, covering match spreads, anything. Um, they've been on a nice little run here, and I do want to point out, even just last week, and this is something I bring up a lot with Miami, was like they weren't winning a ton of hard points, but when they lost them, man, they lost them close. And I feel like that luck was bound to turn for them. And I think we're starting to get that. But even last week, right? Miami plays Seattle. They won that series. But in that series, game four, Miami lose by four points on Vista. Now, it is important to note that they were down 
pretty big, at least 50 points, if not 60, toward the end of that. And Seattle just needed to get over the finish line. And man, oh man, it took them a long time to get those last few points. So they that very easily could have been a comfortable win for Seattle Surge, but Miami did get hot right at the end of the game to make it super, super close. But again, one kill at the end of that game, and Miami end up with the win there, and it's a 3-1 victory. We don't even need to go to game five. And then the very next day, they play Atlanta phase. They cover this the match spread in that with a high-rise control victory. But you look at game one, that was a three-point loss to maybe the best hardpoint team in the game in Atlanta phase. Like, Miami compete with anybody in hard point and even if they're not going to win they're going to keep it close um but good news is i think they're a better hard point team than thieves you mentioned it already if you want to take a minus one and a half on miami that's totally in play because maybe they just take both of the hard points against a mediocre at best hard point team in the thieves yeah you can play miami a, a couple different ways if you just want to take that map one spread totally cool with that too or money line minus 150 not too bad If you want to take them plus one and a half for the extra security, totally okay. And one thing I want to mention too, when I went to Bovada to put in those match uh, or map spreads, I should say, Bovada actually had the odds completely flipped. They had Miami at minus 125 and LA Thieves at minus 110. Very much a toss up, depends where you look for the odds, but yeah, I have it right on a 50-50, so it's about as close as it gets. It's can Miami bank on hard point and something else to get them across the finish line? Or can Thieves bank on their search and control to get them to the finish line? So that's the dynamic we have here, and it should create a very interesting match. Yeah, and that's why it's always important to line shop. Always look for, if you have multiple books, get the best line at any book you can. Moving on to futures previews. Twin outright, phase minus 110, ultra plus 175. Obviously, subliners down to 650. Optic. Optic is still plus a... Th- I've actually... I haven't even looked at these, to be honest. Because I just... At this point, I'm just done with the futures markets for these that are so horrible and distorted. But Optic is plus a 1,000. They're in the loser's bracket. That's crazy. That's such a high number for what that is. That's... I almost can't believe that number. That's crazy. But... All right. Here we are. Optic is plus a 1,000. Seattle is, six, is 16 to 1. Thieves are 20 to 1, Heretics 25 to 1, Legion 50 to 1, LAG 100 to 1, Gorilla Ravens 250 to 1, Minnesota 500 to 1, and Boston Breach is 500 to 1. So there's your odds at Boston Breach making champs is 500 to 1 to start, and then more stuff happens. Again, Phase minus 300, Ultra minus 225, Subliners plus 250. That's not horrible. It's not great though, but it's not horrible. Optic plus 450, Surge plus 750, Thieves 800, Heretics 10 to 1, Legion 20 to 1, Gorilla 50 to 1, Ravens 125 to 1, Rocker 25 to 250 to 1, and then Breach another 250 to 1. I don't like any of these, to be fair. You look at all at phase minus 110 to win outright, that's not horrible, but at the same time, I don't love it either. Ultra plus 175, that's too low. I need that at least 4 to 5 to 1 to consider it. Subliner 650, again, I need that at least 10 to 1. I'm not taking that at less than 10, 10, less than a 10 to 1. Optic, that should... But the problem is that there's your optic price right there, right? That should probably price something along the lines of like 15 to 1, but if they did that, then everybody would have an optic to win ticket. They can't price that, but I don't see a lot here. Moving over to your projections to win the major, you you agree with my initial estimate there. You have phase slightly favored, ultra a little bit lower, and then you basically have that winning percentage drained from subliners and optic and then everybody else as well. Again, like Seattle, like there's huge differences there. And then to make the final... You have ultra slight value, or no, that's the market. You have ultra slight undervalue, phase slight value, and then you have lo- much lower value for subliners, optic, and then all those. But some value on Miami, not almost equal value on Miami. Uh, yeah, maybe. If, if you a... do squint on this odds to reach the major final, Carolina 
has a sliver ah. of value. I believe they're 125 to 1, and I have them in the final about 1% of the time. So if you want to get real crazy with it, Royal Ravens, 125 to 1. That's unlikely to happen, considering they have to win five straight to get there. But their path isn't so bad when you think about they probably play LAG in round one. To me, I'd have Ravens at about a 70-30 favorite in that game. And then round two, I believe, would be that Optic versus Miami or Thieves winner. Um, if Optic are still a pumpkin, then it's going to be Miami or LA Thieves probably. Again, very winnable for Ravens. Uh, and then obviously you need a lot of games to go your way in order to make the final. But it's not completely crazy to think about. Uh, but yeah, just a couple things I want to point out from these two. Phase to me, are good value. And I get that minus 110 still looks ugly because it has a minus in front of it. But... Let's not forget, right a month ago or five weeks ago, FaZe were minus 150 to win Major 3, which at the time I thought was still, that was about right. But yeah, they came up short. They lost a couple game fives on Sunday. Their search and destroy was like weirdly bad all weekend. And to me, they've, based on what they've done at Major 4 qualifiers, they have fixed their search and destroy I'm not sure what happened at Major 3, but it was not pretty. But just looking at their search and destroy this qualifier stage, they went 8-2, and 80% win rate. That's well above their actual win percentage on the season. And the round count was very good. They won just over 60% of the rounds that they played. They had some stiff competition as well. They played New York. They played Toronto. They're likely going to have to play those teams again. We know they're going to play New York again. We know they are very likely to meet up with Toronto if the bracket plays out how we expect it to. So you're still going to have those hard matches, but I think they've fixed those search problems. Their hard point is still very solid. Uh, We saw them split versus Toronto just a week ago. They actually outscored Toronto. They actually won a sub base pretty easily against Toronto, which was a surprise to me, both that they allowed sub base and that they beat Toronto by such a big number. So that was a you know sign that they're going in the right direction if they want to play that map, but they clearly don't have to if they don't want to. So to me, yeah, Atlanta is, despite the loss to Toronto just a week ago, still trending up. Their price is significantly shorter than it was Five weeks ago, same thing with their to reach the final. I think major three, it was minus 400. This time around, it's minus 300, which isn't a huge difference, but it is shorter. Yeah, to me, it's phase have pretty good prices. I think you can make a justification on Toronto to reach the final, considering that their path is pretty easy. That LAG opening match should be a win. And then you're, you don't have to face New York or Optic in that next match. If you win that first match, you get Thieves or Miami, which, again, very winnable. It all comes down to can you get that winner's bracket win over FaZe, most likely, or can you make a little run in lower bracket if you get through? Big picture, I think FaZe is a good price because they are just as good as they were before Major 3, I think they had some bad luck in Major 3, and that's why they got the third place finish. And I'd say this bracket is somewhat easier for them, right? Like, you you do have to play New York in round one, but assuming you can get through that match, like, Optic are the 12 seed. Like, one of these elite teams has crashed out over the last few weeks. You don't even have to worry about them. It's just, can you get through New York? Can you get through Toronto? That's pretty much all you have to do. And maybe you make it down to lower bracket at some point, but Optic probably are done by then. But we'll see. They obviously could turn things around in a hurry if they start to look like what they looked like five weeks ago as well. That's my my thesis on FaZe is just they're the same team, but their prices are much, much shorter. I lean lean FaZe on this one, both in the to win outright and to reach the major final. But I'm totally ready to get my heart broken again when they collapse on Sunday and finish in third. <laughs> yeah, I. it happens. It happened last time, too. Anyways, beating the market and combined model plays. My picks for this week is Legion versus Seattle. I'm, I'm going to take the money line, plus 125. I'm also going to take Miami versus Thieves, 
and then I'm also taking Ultra Map 1 minus D5.5 uh, versus LAG. You are doubling down on what you bet last major, phase to win the major and phase to reach the final. And then you're also taking Legion plus 1.5 minus 175 versus Seattle. Again, we don't really have any sort of combined amount of plays for the futures because only you have that market. I think we would both be on phase to win slash maybe to make the major. I'm not touching it though, but I think that if I had if my model would probably say that as well. I don't think you're gonna recommend Carolina to to reach the final bet. I don't think based off of and this is actually something I, I wanted to mention. I, I forgot there, but when you look at this and it, well, when you do what we do, right? Like uh, people sometimes look at a game like a uh, lines in the book and they're like, oh, I like that line. I like that line. I like that line. We're comparing it to numbers, right? And there's some points when it's, oh, I have 20 points of value from that line. And it's, oh, that's priced at 250. I have that priced at plus 200. Okay, but is that really value, though? Like, you're still saying, okay, like, you're getting 50 points, 50 basis points of value, but that's not actually 50 basis points. It's actually only, like, a couple of points, percentages, points of value. So that that example is perfect right there. Of the, yeah, there's, like, maybe it's a, like, couple of maybe like a half a percent more likely than you think but if something has a one percent chance and you're like i actually it's a 1.25 percent chance don't do that that's not you're not gonna be yeah for some things sure but for that no don't do that not for something not for a i do want to counter that just a bit i do think and this might sound crazy but to me it's it's logical right i think ravens to reach the final at 125 to one is valuable just because you sim this tournament enough i think they reach the final one in every 100 tournaments and the odds makers seem to think that they make it one every 125 tournaments so if you sim for eternity that one bet would be profitable in my estimate in one tournament it's extremely likely to happen we know one percent outcomes aren't bankable at all. They rarely happen. You're basically asking for a 16 seed to beat a one seed in March Madness. It's happened two times in however many hundred times that sort of matchup has occurred. So my thing is that Ravens to reach the final is a better bet than if you were to take, say, in my estimates, New York to reach the final. That is minus EV, but your New York bet there is probably going to, it's going to win some of the time. It might win right now at this major that we're about to play out. So it's always hard to justify that because it's that New York one would be way more likely to happen. Obviously, they're a much better team. They're starting in the winner's bracket. But in the long term, I, I really try to steer clear of anything that shows negative EV just because I know in the long run, those aren't going to work out probably. At the same time, I'm going to be smart and not get absolutely nuts with a 125 to one ticket. So that's my thought on that. But but yeah, you make a good point of a of, of 0.2% edge is okay. Like it, it's not enough to get you excited. You're basically like, yeah, I'm the market. So you could take it or you could not. It, it's either way. That's where I sit on that, but uh, but nonetheless. Watch Carolina win outright now that we're talking about this. And okay, if they do, maybe, I want credit. Yeah. I want credit if yeah. that happens. <laughs> one, one, put $1 on Carolina to reach the final. There you go. There's your hedge. Don't put... I know some people, you, you always see those tickets of, oh, someone put $1,000. No, do, do not put $1,000. But a dollar? Sure. Because here's the thing. Guess what? You put a dollar, Carolina makes it, you win, and, you win $125. That's not bad. That's not yeah, bad. why not? So why not? that be that definitely beats inflation. Anyways, for our combined model plays, we have Vegas money line plus one and a half, map one, map three, and then Miami map one. We both seem to like Miami in the hard point. Uh, there's that. That is it for us uh, for this week. We will be back for the champs preview. It is scheduled for Wednesday, seven seventeen, July seventeenth. But we will very likely record before then. We just are not sure when exactly. It's going to depend on our availability and lines. That Wednesday is the absolute latest we would have it by. Uh, I think it's probably far more likely we'll record the week before. And if we record it, then we'll just put it out. That will be our second last podcast of the year. Our final one will be before, will be before the Esports World Cup. Where I think we're going to have a lot more to talk about. So, yeah. It's going to be a cup. This is an interesting weekend. 
Champs is going to be an interesting weekend, and then I think we're going to have a very interesting offseason this year. A lot can possibly change. So anyways, have a, enjoy the last major of this year, possibly the last major in this format. And we'll see you in a couple weeks, everybody. See ya.